Good afternoon, and welcome to the Chamber's Business Beat Speaker Series. I'm Bruce Stidworthy, President and CEO of Bohannon Houston and Board Chairman of the Greater Albuquerque Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for joining our virtual event today, the first of this program year's Business Beat events, allowing for the business community to hear directly from high-level experts and decision makers on timely and relevant topics. Today is beat number one, and we're talking about New Mexico's finances and economy ahead of what will be a very important 30-day legislative session that will begin next month. As we go into that session, our state budget continues to be in territory we've rarely seen before, larger than ever, with billions more in surplus projected ahead. Oil and gas prices and production remain high, driving growth across the state's revenue stream. Meanwhile, small businesses continue their COVID recovery, finding qualified workers uh, finding qualified workers for all employers remains a challenge, and recent student achievement data points to continued problems in our education system. That affects both workforce development and the ability to recruit new companies and skilled professionals to our state. Our governor, the Senate, and the House will continue to have quite an opportunity this session to make spending decisions that they could only dream about in prior sessions. We're living in very interesting times, how can we make them count? How can we ensure that these year after year windfill, windfalls are not wasted? What problem can we finally address? We're really thankful today to have our new LFC director and state budget expert, Charles Salee with us to give us his perspective on these and other questions. Before we get started, however, I'd like to recognize some really great companies and organizations that are sponsoring today's event. Those companies are p and Resources, President and COO, Don Terry. New Mexico Mutual, President and CEO, Kelly Nixon. The University of New Mexico and its president, Garnett Stokes, including UNM Health Sciences Center, UNM Health, UNM Comprehensive Cancer Center, UNM Athletics, and UNM Rainforest Innovations. Bernalillo County Manager, Julie Morgus Baca. City of Albuquerque, Mayor Tim Keller. Avon Grid, CEO, Pedro Azagra Velasquez, Central New Mexico Community College, President Tracy Hartzler, Excellent Schools New Mexico, Executive Director Scott Heinemann, New Mexico Gas Company, President Brian Shell, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of New Mexico, President Janice Torres, Western Sky Community Care, Vice President of Operations Ramon Martinez, Bank of Albuquerque, New Mexico Market CEO, Kyle Beasley. Bohannon Houston, we're happy to sponsor today's event. U.S. Bank, Vice President Liz Earls. Wagner Equipment, Vice President of Power Systems, Brian Roth. And finally, Fidelity Investments, Vice President of Public Affairs, Leanne Kravitz. Thank you to these great sponsors for their engagement and generosity. Uh, we appreciate each of you very much. With that, let me welcome in Chamber and President CEO, Terry Cole, and she will introduce our featured speaker. Terry? Thank you, Bruce, and happy holidays to everyone. We're excited that you're joining us. And I agree with everything Bruce said in his opening. From a budget standpoint, especially so close to a global pandemic, I don't imagine anyone could have ever predicted we'd have a state budget over $9 billion, with billions in revenue growth still ahead. And I echo your point, Bruce, the business community, and in fact, all residents are really counting on the state to set the right priorities and make changes we've needed to make for quite some time. On everything from taxes and infrastructure to public education improvements and workforce development. So let's jump in. Charles Salee is the new director of the New Mexico Legislative Finance Committee. He's with us today to talk state finances, and we're so lucky and so grateful to have him, especially at such a busy time of year for him. 
On behalf of the legislature, Charles oversees the construction of the budget, keeps legislators apprised of fiscal and economic developments in the state, and leads a staff of program evaluators who analyze the effectiveness of various programs in state government. Charles is in his first year of leading the LFC, voted to replace 20-year veteran David Abbey unanimously in August of this year. He previously served at the LFC's uh, deputy director for 12 years and also as a program evaluator in the Roundhouse for five years. Some of his work has led to major policy changes or cost savings in the areas of Medicaid, higher education, adult and juvenile corrections, public schools, and workers' compensation. Mr. Salee grew up in New Mexico and earned a BSW from New Mexico State University and MSW administration from Texas State University in San Marcos. After Charles presents, he'll take uh, some questions from our board and from many of you. During his presentation, if you'd like to pose a question, please just type in the Q&A box on the screen and we'll try to get to as many of you as we can. So welcome, Charles. The floor is yours. Great. Thanks so much, Terry. Uh, thank you for having me today. I'm going to uh, go through a presentation if we can get that posted and talk about uh, where we're at um, for our fiscal outlook as a state and where we might be heading this session. And then some topics that really matter for our, our long term economic success as a state. You go to the roller coaster slide. Next one. So. What we don't want to have happen is this. We're, we're riding this roller coaster. We're on the upward trajectory right now and then end up going off the rails. Next slide. But this is our actual general fund roller coaster. And I can run this uh, graph back for 40 years and it's really a, a story of boom and bust um, for the state of New Mexico. Um, and a lot of that is driven by our, our wealth and reliance on um, oil and gas revenue. Next slide. In this particular slide, you can see that the revenue growth that we've been experiencing over the past couple of years totally overshadows that roller coaster ride that we had been on um, in the early 2000s to the Great Recession to the oil price bust. Tremendous revenue growth. The thing that's uh, going to be occurring starting in FY25, however, is that upward trajectory is going to level off. So the difference between the line which is our recurring general fund revenue and the bar graph, which are recurring general fund appropriations has been building up. We haven't been spending it all as a state, um, but still having really healthy and big increases in uh, recurring state uh, appropriations, just not as fast as the revenue has been growing. Each year that the legislature doesn't appropriate the full amount of um, the recurring revenue, that money will show up in next year's calculation for what we call new money. And that new money calculation is next year's revenue um, compared to this year's appropriations amount. And we'll talk about that big number that's hanging out there and why it's really uh, mostly gives us a window of opportunity in the near term to potentially catch up through spending through either the tax code or, or through the budget but that it's not necessarily um, long-term um, growth rates like we've seen in the past. Next slide. Go to the next slide. Oil and gas are driving most of this increase. Next slide. And we've been working the past two interims on more um, long-term fiscal planning, um, both long-term revenue forecasts that are done by our consensus revenue estimating group, as well as starting to dig into what is our, our long-term um, cost of opening government look like in the out years. And that has been really a useful exercise. You might ask yourself, well, that's the norm in business. Why hasn't government been doing that? And part of it is because we've been on that roller coaster boom and bust ride um, for so long that we were worried about planning for six months, let alone, you know, the next 20 years. Um, 
But what's driving this increase and what makes it different than that roller coaster ride that we've been on is this is driven by um, oil production. If we draw this graph back to the early 80s, you'd see production levels were basically uh, would be essentially flat over that period of time. And then starting at around 2017, 2018, um, they started increasing significantly um, in the amount of um, oil being pulled out of the ground. And they've continued that way, and that's driving a lot of this increase. Well, over the long term, there's going to be a peak in that oil production, not because of lack of oil, but because of decarbonization policy. Um, this, this is a graph where industry is, is basically, and this um, peak oil production actually moved up a couple of years um, after the war in Ukraine started and Europe started transitioning their economy a lot faster than before, um, but peaking at towards the end of this decade. So what we wanna try to avoid is building all of that money into our recurring base budget, even though that it's a, it's a gradual decline in the out years, um, you don't wanna build in that peak that you know about uh, to fund your schools um, or anything else, because what are you gonna replace it with? It's, it's an enormous amount of money that you'd be putting into the base budget and growing it fast. And so the legislature's enacted some um, fiscal policies that basically has been chopping off these peaks in oil production and putting them in um, permanent funds. And the latest of which uh, will send some of these peak oil production into the severance tax permanent fund that will then return money back to the general fund, almost on a, a replacement dollar for dollar in those out years after peak oil production. But that's just gonna keep our general fund basically flat. Um, and that's really important to consider what kind of transition we're gonna need as an economy to afford the government that the people want um, and, may, and may even need um, the state of New Mexico into the future. Next slide. So there's two things that have been going on that are acting as headwinds to uh, that general fund growth in the out years that I was just mentioning. One are tax policy changes that the state's already uh, made, both on a recurring and a non-recurring basis. Those will be growing over time, both as broad-based GRT reductions that have been enacted since 2019, as well as uh, tax expenditures. Next slide. This is a good example of corporate income tax and how tax policy changes will act as a headwind um, into the uh, next five to 10 years um, for revenue growth. Corporate in income taxes were largely on life support uh, since the Great Recession, um, finally rebounding to um, you know, pre-recession, pre-Great Recession, corporate income taxes were running about 400 million. They dropped for about a decade to about $70 million a year. And you can see them starting to rebound into FY23. Um, that red bar is a result of policy changes to greatly expand the film tax credit. So now not only will we not be getting um, increased revenue from corporate income taxes, that money will be going out of the treasury um, back to um, film tax cuts or the, the film tax subsidies. Next slide. One of the rationales for uh, putting money uh, that is coming from peak oil production into those permanent funds, whether it's early childhood or whether it's the severance tax, was to um, one, not build in that peak into the recurring revenues, but two, um, to decrease our ultimate reliance on that uh, volatile revenue source, uh, which actually worked. Um, we we're less dependent um, on oil and gas running at about 40% of our general fund, um, about 50% if you inc include the money coming out of those permanent funds into the general fund, um, and greatly reduce the reliance on it um, as a result of that action. However, with the other broad-based um, tax cuts that have been done or, or the tax expenditures that have been implemented, that's having the opposite effect of making us more reliant on oil and gas um, out into the future. So there's trade-offs to these strategies, and right now they seem to be um, kind of countering each other and, and keeping our reliance on oil and gas in that 30 to 40% range. Next slide. So this is the big number that you all saw in August, um, where revenues were expected to produce 
you know, a $3.4 billion uh, surplus uh, next year over what we've appropriated this year, that new money calculation. What I'd like you to pay attention to on this slide is at the very bottom, the annual percent change, where we were seeing like 20 plus percent growth year over year um, in revenue starting to slow in FY24 to 8.3%. FY25, uh, over the next five years for the August um, forecast is only at about three and a half percent, assuming no changes in, in tax revenue. So that's an important kind of leveling out piece, both the, the headwinds that the general fund faces from all the tax policy changes, as well as the, the fiscal policy changes that we've done means that we need to ride our broader um, economic um, wealth um, and not rely as heavily on, on oil and gas. Next slide. So this shows you the effect of some of those policies where oil and gas was built into FY24 growth of revenues. Um, those have been capped. Um, and so FY25 will not have them. And the effects of some of those other tax changes will also be um, acting, like I said, as a headwind to revenue growth. Where the one area of our, our revenue that is steady, that is strong, and that is increasing year over year um, at a very predictable rate is the income coming from our permanent funds. Next slide. Uh, these are just some of the tax expenditures that are growing. Uh, the biggest ones from this last session were for things like the child tax credit um, and low income uh, tax rebate. So uh, citizen benefit tax expenditures, not necessarily intended to spur economic development. Next slide. Next slide. Economic outlook is pretty solid. Um, there's some uncertainty out there settling in um, to pretty strong growth. Uh, U.S. real GDP and prices have, have started uh, coming back down within um, what the Fed is would like to see in terms of um, those CPI increases. Next slide. So the effects of the um, of the Federal Reserve action to raise interest rates is having a uh, the desired effect, and we're not really projecting going into a recession anymore. One thing that's probably holding us back, uh, certainly in New Mexico, and you're feeling this as, as businesses, is our labor force participation uh, has inched up slightly, but it's still far below um, what the national average is. Um, and it's causing labor supply issues. It's causing wages to probably grow faster and put upward pressure on that um, inflation that we've seen. Next slide. Like I said, outside of oil and gas, there is some uncertainty, but I would say we're um, in a much better position in, in terms of where we think we're gonna be heading economically um, this December than we were last December where, when the economists were um, had a lot more uncertainty with where we were heading. Next slide. These are stress tests that we perform um, and they're basically what if scenarios. Uh, that we built into our uh, revenue estimating process over the past couple of years. Um, these stress tests are really important because they help inform key fiscal policies that the committee adopts, including how much money should we set aside um, in our reserves in case uh, revenues go awry. So in this particular case, the economists were running scenarios for a recession, um, for low price uh, for oil um, and production falling off, and there's very little upside risk uh, going on right now where we're at, we're so we're, because our revenues are climbing so fast, uh, there's more downside risk. This is important because the, the committee has a policy um, that it adopted with a, a target of 30% money in our reserves, our basically savings account, accessible savings account. It should be 30% of however much we're appropriating in that particular year um, for spending. That's up from you know, 5% when I first started it at LFC. Um, and that really wasn't even a real 5% um, target because it included um, the tobacco settlement permanent fund, which really is never intended to, to dip into in case revenues don't come in. The legislature put that permanent fund and counted it towards reserves when we had the dot-com bust and didn't have any money in reserves to be able to say, well, look, here's some money and it's about 5%, but it's not real. 
Um, the committee's recommended taking that out of the calculation and moving it out of the uh, general fund reserves and letting the state investment council be more aggressive with investing it and actually treating it as a true permanent fund, um, not as a difficult to access reserve fund. Next slide. Next slide. So budget outlooks, as is obvious, if your out year revenues are only growing three and a half percent, you can't keep spending 10 to 15% a year for very long. Um, and that budget surplus will dry up very, very fast. And I advise the committee to think about tax cuts in the same way that they think about um, spending in terms of the impact on the surplus or, or future deficits. Um, it's, you know, if you spend 10% through House Bill 2 and another 2% equivalent of 2% or $200 million through uh, a tax cut package, that has the same effect of 12% of, of uh, new spending overall when you're looking at these types of scenarios. What's important about this long-term assessment of our, um, our budget needs is we don't have a lot of uh, real cost pressures within the budget. We've got a declining K-12 population. Uh, we've had for the last decade a declining higher education um, enrollment. So we're not dealing with soaring enrollments and the need to hire more teachers and uh, more faculty, build more buildings. Um, we're essentially just pouring money into those sectors and increasing the unit cost of them with the hopes that it will produce um, better outcomes. But the one area of the budget where we do have long-term um, pressure is in Medicaid. And it's gonna be long-term pressure whether we're prosperous or whether we're poor. If we're more prosperous and we continue to increase like we've done over the past couple of years, our personal per capita income, which should really be our goal um, over the long term as a, as a replacement for, and for that oil and gas um, revenue um, that won't be growing in the out years, but will be hopefully maintained by the permanent fund. Really the strategy for that um, new diversified economy is that things that increase our personal per capita income. So that increased and the federal government said, that's great, uh, New Mexico, for next year, you're a little wealthier. You can help pay for more Medicaid. So our met federal matching rate will go down less than 1% and that will cost $68 million. That's larger than most state agencies entire budget. Um, and we won't get anything more for that. We'll just be replacing that lost federal funds. So the more prosperous we get, Medicaid will chew up a larger um, amount of whatever new money is available. If we're not as prosperous and we're, we continue to be poor, they'll pay a greater share, but we will probably have larger uh, Medicaid rolls. Um, and we do have an aging um, elderly and disabled population that is the most expensive cost center in, in Medicaid uh, budget that will put cost pressures on the upward end um, no matter what. Next slide. So if we can continue to do nice budgets because we've got a lot of um, challenging needs we need to, to try to overcome as a state, um, but about 1% slower growth in recurring spending um, translates into five more years of surplus. And that surplus can be used in a couple of different ways. Um, one way is, you know, we've put a lot of money into the permanent funds. There's very little, in my estimation, need for more of them. There's, there's one area like higher education where I think um, that would be a good area to offset future liabilities if the legislature wants to maintain as robust of a financial aid uh, program as we have. Um, we've done big budget increases that we can't sustain, but we do have needs and they're kind of in the midterm. So it's kind of a Goldilocks situation. We don't wanna to do too little and it's not even politically feasible to do that. That's why I don't even have that graph on here, but to do too much, we'll be underwater too fast. So the challenge is how do we take that almost non-recurring surplus and spread it out over the next couple of years? And how do we use that in a way that gets better results? And one way is, is what we've been doing um, and that's multi-year funding for different uh, types of initiatives. Probably needs a lot more guardrails, a lot more accountability, and a lot more test work 
um, to make sure that before we grow an agency's base budget, we're going to see a demonstration project and it's actually working. Um, so that's one strategy that we're, we're looking at um, with the committee uh, as a way to continue to meet those midterm uh, needs. Next slide. So all of these investments, um, advising the committee, we really need it to make it count at the end of the day, whether it's education, higher education, Medicaid, um, those investments need to result in almost transformational kinds of, um, of impacts over the long term to overcome those long term headwinds that we're going to be experiencing with oil and gas. Uh, resisting spending all the recurring revenues now and try to spread that out into the future. Um, continue to identify where there are peak revenue things that are not really recurring um, over the long term. Um, and make sure that, you know, our, our um, inflows uh, to those permanent funds um, are steady. The nice thing about what the legislature has done with some of these fiscal policies over the past couple of years is we've now insulated the general fund from some oil and gas volatility. So if something catastrophic starts happening with oil prices or oil production, the severance tax permanent fund, the early childhood um, permanent fund will feel the effects of that in a significant way from those direct energy revenues first. The general fund will still feel the effect of it. If you're if drilling slows down dramatically, our gross receipts taxes are going to be impacted by that. But that's why you have 30% reserves, that you can use that um, to hopefully plug a hole without needing to go in and cut um, agency budgets that were very painful um, for folks in the Great Recession and the oil bust. Next slide. Here we go to the next slide. So how do you make those investments count to improve personal per capita income? And it's really through a more educated population. Um, and right now our education system is not optimal. We're not getting the results. I think everybody would agree that we want. And the um, state district court basically said that we are violating kids' constitutional rights because the outcomes, including from student standardized student test scores, high school graduation rates are quote unquote dismal. And therefore that the inputs, both funding and programming must be insufficient. The court made a causal link. How you spend money and how much you spend make a difference on those outcomes. And then that we're not doing a good job of making sure that everybody's doing it right. Um, implementation issues. Next slide. What our research has found, and, and this is some national research from um, Stanford University, they linked all of the different um, state test to the National Assessment of Education Progress for multiple cohorts of students to track their progress over time. Not to be surprised, blue is not good. That's where, you know, lots of kids are below grade level. Some, in some cases, you know, three to four grade levels below where we need them to be. Green is a, at or above grade level. So Massachusetts, no surprise there, highest performing education system in the country. A little bit of a mixed bag in Florida, Tennessee looks like us, and Arizona and California. Next slide. So that previous slide was, are kids meeting the benchmark? And that's an important question to answer. On We do it on a regular basis. But what we don't do with our accountability system is to see whether our education system is producing at least a year's worth of academic growth. That's what it's designed to do. It says you come into third grade and we teach you the third grade standards and then you go to fourth grade. The challenge is many, many, many of our kids are showing up in kindergarten uh, two, two and a half years behind. We're closing some of that gap uh, with pre-K and, and the robust investments we've been making there, but still not closing it entirely. Um, but when kids get into school, this, this um, map is showing us, are they making learning grades that meet or exceed the, the national average um, for a year's worth of growth. And here, New Mexico shines. So when kids are in school, they're actually doing pretty good. The problem is, if you're in third grade and you're reading at a first grade level and they get you to read at a second grade level when you in third grade, now you're in fourth grade and you're still behind. So we have to figure out how to close that gap. Pre-K is one, 
Um, the extended learning initiatives that the state has been doing, the court found, is another big strategy. Kids just aren't in school enough in New Mexico. So the school calendars are not long enough. There's There's been a push to increase the instructional hour requirement. Uh, APS managed to meet that and still shorten their calendar uh, by adding small increments to the day, uh, as opposed to like big chunks of additional instructional time. Next slide. We found with our own analysis of, of this New Mexico specific data that cohorts of students um, over time are, are doing better, but nowhere near a level of, of kind of catch up growth that we call it um, to get where we want them to be. And on, on this park test, you know, Massachusetts is at 50%. Um, it's a very rigorous exam, was a very rigorous exam that we used. Um, the court hasn't said where we need to be to not be violating kids constitutionally um, rights, um, but certainly uh, we're not where we need to be. Next slide. One of the biggest challenges is the achievement gap. So kids that are not on free and reduced lunch, not from low income families and not learning English are performing at that 50% benchmark that we would normally say, we'd like it to be higher, but that's you know uh, really good. But then when it comes to the vast majority of kids in the state are actually on free and reduced lunch. And many of them are also on free and reduced lunch and learning English. And for those for those kids, they're still making progress over time. You can see, um, you know, going from about 19 percent to 24 percent for this cohort of, of students from fifth grade to eighth grade. But for kids that are learning English as well, we're failing them. Um, and it's not just me saying it. That's what the, the court findings were as well. Next slide. We've been doing a lot of discussions in the committee um, this interim about what if scenarios, just like we did with the stress test. Well, what would it take for New Mexico to be at the national average and not be 50th in everything? And we ran this analysis for like high school graduation. Take 2,200 more students spread across all those different high schools around the state to graduate on time um, versus how many did in the last cohort. Um, for many schools, it's like, you know, a small district like Pecos, it's like six kids for some of the larger high schools in Santa Fe, it'd be 40 to 50. Um, so when you start breaking down those challenges, it, it looks a lot more manageable. Why can't we do this? And the committee's really focused and had a lot of questions this interim for uh, different high ranking officials on, well, what would it take? How much would that cost? Why is that not achievable over the next couple of years? Very performance oriented um, discussion. Same thing, we're fourth in funding for higher education 50th in producing graduates with a bachelor's degree and in six years. Uh, I didn't know you could take six years to graduate when I was going through undergraduate. I thought you had to be out in four. Maybe that was just my parents, but it would take less than a thousand students. About 990 would need to graduate on time to be at the national average for our four-year institutions. It's like 300 for uh, UNM, about 200, 250 for NMSU. We need more more educated population. We have to have uh, more kids coming out of our, even though they're a shrinking um, pool of, of students, we need a much higher percentage coming out on time. And we shouldn't be lowering standards in order to achieve these types of things. We want our students to be college and career ready. That way they can go on uh, to attain that higher uh, personal per capita income. Next slide. So we have booming revenues. They're kind of going to be tapering off you know, flattening out over the next couple of years. So we've got to figure out how to spread that out. We still have ongoing education litigation. I would say there's not a huge, uh, given the 1.3 billion that the state has um, put into uh, education in response to Martinez Yazzie, there's not very many things outside of maybe special education where the legislature hasn't in a significant way addressed some of the court findings. Uh, same thing with investments in early childhood, uh, new strategic investments in Medicaid. We need to make sure at the end of the day, they count, they, that we're targeting funding to what works. Uh, implementation is an Achilles heel across the board. Um, child protective services struggles are not due to lack of resources. Um, 
And so monitoring that spending and, and whether or not we're going to change trajectory in, in the outcomes to be able to have a more prosperous state is something that continues to need heightened, um, heightened oversight. With that, I'd be happy to start answering questions. Okay, sorry for the delay. It took a second for me to get off mute. <clears throat> Thank you, Charles. Uh, excellent presentation. You fired through a whole lot of stuff there. Um, and I think we're going to have some good questions for you here. As Terry noted earlier, uh, this is speaking to the audience now, uh, if you have questions, please do enter them in the Q&A box. We have a few there now, uh, and we will get to those momentarily. Our first question, though, um, is going to come from Janice Torres. Uh, we're pleased to have her from Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Uh, and Janice, what is your question for Charles? Sure. Uh, thank you, Charles, for your insightful presentation. You walked us through how strong our oil and gas revenue has been for several years and continues to be, and how it's been um, an outsized economic driver for, us, for our state. What's the biggest threat to the industry right now? And is there another bright spot in our economic outlook that we can look to for diversification? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, you know, one thing that's been happening over the past couple of years is where oil is being produced is shifting more towards federal lands. Um, in the past, it was run roughly 50-50 federal and state. Now it's inching up into the the mid 60s um, on on federal land. So much more exposure to uh, potential federal policy changes um, for environmental regulation and, and, and other types of things than we've had in the past. So that's a that's a, a, a new exposure that's going on. Um, the other thing in terms of bright spots with the with the economy, you know, construction is really booming right now. Uh, we've got 5.2 billion dollars in the the state's pipeline includes everything from normal capital outlay to public schools. Um, I'm a little bit worried about slamming another two billion dollars into that pipeline that's really struggling to keep up with. Prices are shooting up. Um, you know, contractors seem to have more than enough work. Can't find labor in order to get more work done. Or other states are are transporting our labor down there to other really big um, private um, project projects that we're hearing. So construction's good. Long term, you know, I would say um, business services are an area that we should be looking at in terms of uh, growth. Doesn't require uh, a lot of, it doesn't require really much water um, resources. Um, manufacturing, it will be interesting to see if we can create a manufacturing ecosystem around the the newly announced plant um, down in Mesa del Sol. Um, but broadly speaking, it seems to me business services might be someplace that we should be, be looking broadly, but you need a more educated population to really make that, um, make that work. Okay, thank you, Charles, and, uh, and good question, Janice. Um, I've got a couple of questions as well, and, and Terry may jump in here um, in addition to some of the questions that we have here in the Q&A. Um, one topic that affects every New Mexican is health care. Uh, and for anybody who's tried to schedule an appointment with pretty much any kind of a specialist, um, <laughs> you, you can appreciate the challenges. Um, Charles, the state has made some big investments in our healthcare workforce in the last year, uh, including reimbursement rates, nursing slots in our colleges, and student loan repayment plans. Given the demand for healthcare workers, do you anticipate any additional, additional investment in that area, um, especially as many of these professionals are retiring and leaving New Mexico, and given the push for Medicaid forward covering more patients? Sorry, there's a lot there in that question, but I'll, I'll uh, leave you to it. Yeah, the, there will be a continued effort um, to sort of support broadening the, enlarging the pipeline of, of professionals, whether it's enticing them to, to move from out of state to New Mexico or, or increasing our educational output. Um, I think we need to be having conversations about how to better leverage Medicaid um, to assist with some of those things. You know, we made a, a big push this past um legislative session for massive Medicaid rate increases for a, a variety of different high priority providers. 
with the intent that, uh, you know, if you're looking at opening a business in New Mexico in healthcare and you see your panel might be full of 45 to 50% of people on Medicaid, yikes, from a business standpoint, that is scary. But if Medicaid is paying much better than the surrounding states, uh, maybe that makes that equation a little bit different. I think we need to be working with and leveraging the managed care companies to help with, with some of our workforce development as well. Um, you know, we're contracting with them to provide a certain network of providers. And if that network is inadequate, I don't buy just throwing up our hands and saying that's the broader state's problem. But I think that, you know, as purchasers of healthcare, we need to work with the managed care companies to figure out how to partner in, in ensuring that you don't have to go out of state for those specialty services, that you can get them right here. Terry, did you have a question you wanted to jump in with? Yes. You know, uh, Charles, I wanted to go back to education. I thought you did a wonderful job, by the way, of laying out the challenges and the opportunities and uh, in a very uh, instructional way for everyone who really wants to help and be part of the debate. So uh, thank you for doing that. I wanted to just ask you another question about education it has to do with what your thoughts are on the disparity between the federal and state student academic assessments so are we setting our stu students up to compete in the national and global marketplaces and is there something about our academic assessments for students that can change and improve uh the outcomes we hope for well, the first thing is we need to get the student test data and use it. It didn't come out till this fall. That's not usable for teachers. We're, we're paying for a test that's testing at the beginning, middle, and end of the year. That information needs to be made um, available sooner to both the public as well as the practitioners uh, to use that to inform uh, what we're doing. We found that we have a lot of high poverty schools that actually are hitting it out of the park. And one of their key characteristics for doing that is the schools using data. It's, in, it's informing what they're doing. Um, they have high expectations for all students, regardless of their background. You come to this school, you're going to be college and career ready. That's what our expectation is for you. And students, you know, lo and behold, meet it. Uh, we have schools that reject both of those. And we can predict right out of the gate when we do our organizational assessment, they're not going to be doing very well by school. So there's a, a bunch of things for you know, unpacking that. NAEP is a, a, a very rigorous exam. It's a, almost a reformer's dream test um, with how, you know, like I said, Massachusetts is like 50% proficient on NAEP. Um, we've got, for all intents and purposes, the assessment that we have in the state right now seems fine. We haven't lowered the bar on it. Park was very strong, um, but getting the data and sticking with the test for a longer period of time seemed to be the, the near-term challenges. Um, from my perspective. That's well said. Uh, Bruce, back to you. Thanks, Terry. Um, and, and thank you, Charles, for that answer. It is well said. Um, I, I'm going to ask one more question on the topic of infrastructure, and then we're going to get to the QA uh, in, in the chat. Uh, and thank you for those that have already submitted questions. Um, so as you've noted in your presentation, we've been fortunate to have multiple successes, uh, successive years of record surpluses and unspent revenue. Uh, how can the state finally prioritize its infrastructure spending so that uh, so that it's game changing and we can look back in 20 years uh, without regret at what we didn't fix? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we've been one. You know, we've supplemented the um, road funding with general fund appropriations to the tune of about a billion and a half dollars. Our roads are improving significantly, but we haven't done any major infrastructure projects like a big eye or a loop um, that could have game changing economic development. Part of it is, you know, and that's true even for capital. I, I tell my members, I don't see anybody having a top shelf project out there that is even close to like design or ready to go um, just as a major infrastructure investment. Um, and when we get too much money and look for those, sometimes we end up buying things like the spaceport 
that aren't maybe a strategically uh, good investment as something else could have been. Um, the other thing is that I, I'm concerned about, I call it the peanut butter effect, that you spread your resources really thin to make everybody happy. And right now we can spread that peanut butter a little thicker, you know, instead of people asking for 5 million for their project, they're just adding a zero, but not much difference in, in thinking about what those types of investments would be. So I think there needs to be a lot more discussion amongst groups like this, as well as with policymakers on what are those types of big strategic investments you know, um, that are needed. Everything from quality of life, like a 15,000 seat, you know, arena in Albuquerque to, um, you know, recreation centers in um, Gallup. So okay. the challenge will be not spreading ourselves thin because those are big expensive projects. And one thing that we've been able to do the past couple of years that will have a long-term benefit is not bond when we have so much cash. So we've been cash financing capital outlay, which means that those severance taxes that aren't needed for bond repayment are going into the severance tax permanent fund and will be a, a new source of revenue in the out years. Yeah, personally, I think that's an excellent way to move money into the future. Um, so glad to have seen that happening. Uh, Terry, did you want to ask, speaking of that, yeah, just, about tax reform? Yeah, one uh, quick question on tax reform. Um, so when the budget is bleak, not having enough uh, money to go around is, ex is an excuse for not doing tax reform. And when we're flush, having money is a go-to excuse not to do tax reform. So, you know, where what's going to happen at some point? If we're not doing tax reform now, when will it happen? What are your thoughts about that? You're not going to like my answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, that's why I was, I was trying to talk when we, we've done a whole host of tax cuts. Are they the right ones for... You know, the right ones because the legislature, you know, passed them. So from the legislature's perspective, they are the right ones. But if you're if the intended purpose is tax cuts in order to spur economic uh, development, you know, we've had a lot of discussions this interim of whether or not that high cost to do like a big GRT reduction is worth it versus other investments in human capital or more targeted investments in business support. The bottom line is revenues are only growing three and a half percent and any dollar going for more tax cuts is a dollar that gets us faster to that being upside down. So not a lot of room for huge recurring tax cuts absent becoming even more dependent on oil and gas. So that's tax reform. Tax reform would entail broadening the base and lowering the rate. I think there are opportunities to continue those discussions um, I'm not sure that that will be in play during the 30 day session to have a meaning, if, particularly when you start looking at what are the biggest tax expenditures that exist out there, food, medical, film, uh, those types of things that don't seem to have traction to like use to lower the GRT rate. Thank you, Charles. I'm, I'm just going to tag on to that. What about uh, eliminating? Um, the pyramiding inside of GRT as opposed to just lowering the rate. Any sort of opinion on that topic? Sure. That um, is definitely a lower cost strategy that's very targeted. Um, to be honest with you, some of my concerns are not with the um, the policy. Again, it's it's just like spending. You're you're going to be if that's the best use rather than spending it through House Bill 2, spending it through the tax code gets you a big, better bang for the buck. Either way, it accelerates that being underwater uh, kind of piece because of all the cumulative effects of the tax cuts that we've done in the past. My biggest concern is from a technical standpoint of writing the law in a way that doesn't create an unintentional loophole for say, you know, Los Alamos or Sandia to all of a sudden, and that's already happening. There's challenges going on with, with other types of tax expenditures that we've done that we're concerned about um, that technically we might be a little bit vulnerable to um, more lost revenue than what we had wanted or intended. Very and then the, the, there's serious opposition 
um, from the municipalities for uh, pyramiding because that would come out of their base as well. And then you get into a discussion of, well, do we need to backfill that from the state like a hold harmless like we've done with food and medical? And then that's a new whole big expenditure that's not really buying as much. Uh, Bruce, do you mind if I ask just a quick question? So, um, uh, Charles, can we at least go into this session and say no new income tax increases or consumption? Can't we do that? Yeah, I think that there's going to be discussion about a range of different uh, tax changes for sure, whether they want to revisit the pit, uh, smoothing out, whether um, changes to all of those myriad of of um, climate change related tax expenditures that um, were very popular amongst some groups. Um, I expect those to, to come back and be, you know, discussed. Um, in terms of like tax increases, I haven't heard much discussion other than on um, alcohol. Thank you. And by context, some of the proposals on that, um, the advocates would say would bring in about 250 million and that, in the context of our entire behavioral health system, is huge because it, last year we spent a billion dollars on behavioral health. So to have like one aspect of the behavioral health, one as that's just provides context. That's a lot of a lot of money for a variety of things that I know they want to use it for. But yeah, indeed. Okay, um, let's go to a couple questions from our from our uh, online audience. This first question, Charles, is from Tracy Hartzler with CNM. Um, she she wrote, while post-secondary enrollments have not grown, grown, the need to train and educate adults is significant, as noted by the high number of individuals not participating in the labor market, and as workforce development is needed by uh, economic development and organizations like ours. How does uh, the LFC propose to address workforce training uh, and meeting employer demands for a skilled workforce? Or Hi, Tracy, good say, question. Uh, what is the LFC's recommendation? <laughs> well, our, our recommendation, our specific recommendations will come out in January, but the legislature did appropriate um, and made available about $20 million for really targeted industry needed um, workforce um, training and education programs. So, so it's almost a pilot basis and we're really excited to see um, how that plays out. Community colleges will pay, play an important part of meeting the, the needs of employers because of their ability to work quicker um, and have shorter uh, programs. I'm, we're still a little bit perplexed about who's not in the labor force and, and why and how are they surviving. We know broadly the statistics are if you uh, have very little education, you're likely going to be outside of the workforce and not participating in, in the labor market. So figuring out how to connect, whether they're youth or adults, how to identify those individuals, get them into um, quick training programs and get them employed and then look at a path forward for further education over time seems to be you know, a, a high priority need um, for the state. Okay, excellent. We're just about out of time, but I'm gonna try to squeeze in one more here. Uh, we have a question from Carl Holm and it's regarding um, behavioral health, which you touched on a minute ago. It says, what are your thoughts on developing behavioral assets to stem the mounting issues with underage crime, homelessness, and public safety? Are there state initiatives to develop a more robust trades education in high school and beyond to develop more skills based on working population to enhance employment opportunities and encourage more corporate and job relocations in New Mexico. Okay, so there was kind of a behavioral health and education uh, twist to the question there. Yeah, when it comes to um, behavioral health, we have to really dramatically increase the pipeline of um, educated workers that will go in and fill those jobs. The legislatures, um, I've never seen a legislature do this, but they basically endowed doubling the capacity of the social work colleges to enroll in graduate uh, students. Uh, big endowments for um, the uh, teacher colleges as well as nursing. Whether that comes to fruition or not is something we're monitoring right now. Um, but in terms of career and technical, yes, there is a, a 
been a pretty robust move towards expanding those types of offerings in high schools across the state. I will say that from my perspective, it's kind of all over the map. And no matter what, we should be having conversations with families and students that if you want to survive in this global economy, you will need some form of post-secondary education. Participating in a CTE welding course in high school is not going to uh, result in you being really career ready. There's good, there's, there's, the programs just don't have you come out that way. It's, it's, they're, they're not designed um, to be able to do that. It's almost like career exploration and, and maybe get some credits out of the way, um, but nowhere near being able to, to be career ready. And, and we need to have that conversation on a regular basis that CTE doesn't mean no post-secondary education. All right, very good. Thank you, Charles. Uh, appreciate uh, you you uh, entertaining all of our questions here. Uh, to wrap up our event today, I'm gonna pass it back to Janice Torres of Blue Cross Blue Shield for some closing com comments. Janice? Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. And I agree. Um, Charles, thank you. That was an incredibly uh, informative presentation and conversation. Um, as a business community, we certainly believe that a cash flush state government is a good thing and certainly better than the alternative, which we've experienced far too many times before. However, when revenues are booming and especially when they look like they'll stay that way for a while, for a little while at least, it's tempting for everything to suddenly become a priority. We sure hope that doesn't play out. It's clear that now is the time to reform our tax code, adopt big changes to make New Mexico an easier place to do business more competitive with our other states and more tax friendly for workers, families and businesses alike. It's also time to focus our capital spending on rebuilding the foundations of our economy and communities. In 20 years, we, sh we shouldn't look back and say, if only we had spent those infrastructure dollars more wisely. It's time to commit to changing our public education system one school at a time. And we could do that by investing in proper training, development, and pay for truly great school leaders. Great principals will turn struggling schools into increasingly better schools. If we want better student performance, we need the very best leaders in our schools who have the expectations and know-how to get it done. And we have to finally invest in ensuring our criminal justice system can stand up to the career criminals who continue to run rampant on our streets. Stop catching and releasing them, put more officers on the streets to stop them, raise prosecutors pay to attract and retain the very best attorneys to put them behind bars and invest in new technology and data anal analysis to ensure our justice system becomes smarter than they are. We live in a wonderful place but we face some big challenges that have hung around our state for far too long. It's time to beat them back and with focus and yes, a big surplus, we can get it done. So on behalf of the chamber, we would like to once again, thank these great sponsors of today's Business Beat event. PNM, UNM, Bernalillo County, New Mexico Mutual, the City of Albuquerque, Avangrid, CNM, Excellent Schools New Mexico, New Mexico Gas Company, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of New Mexico, Western Sky Community Care, Bank of Albuquerque, Bohannon Houston, U.S. Bank, Wagner, and Fidelity. We want to thank everyone for attending today's first installment of the 2023-2024 Business Beat Speaker Series. Our next chamber event is tomorrow at the Albuquerque Convention Center. It's our public safety big luncheon, and we're looking forward to seeing all of you there who have already registered. Thank you.